Everybody, welcome to episode number 62, Social Selling 2.0. I'm here again with Carson and Brandon and our special guest, Matt Dixon. Matt, welcome. Hey, guys. Uh, great to be here. Uh, it's it's great to be with guys I've only stalked on LinkedIn, but haven't actually met in person yet. So it's, uh, it's fun. That's how I was with Brandon. I stalked him for years. <laughs> Doesn't everybody, though? Come on. Yeah, Matt, I, if you, actually, Matt, I did an event last month in Seattle, and I had more people come up to me asking, Do you know Brandon Lee, right? And knowing who I was. So, yeah, it's like he's like the Kevin Bacon of social selling or something. Carson, you are so <laughs> full of crap. That'll be his name in next week's episode. Car Carson, were you stalking him so you could get to Leah Thompson? Was that where you were, where you were trying to accomplish? You caught, me. you caught me. It's the Back to the Future tie in. <laughs> Brandon was in the movie, Matt. So, yeah. Oh, all right. The star power. <laughs> yeah. The, the challenge is if you blink, you missed it. So don't, don't get too impressed. Hey, at least you're in it. <laughs> well, welcome everybody who is online. We see, I see Bob and Larry already jumping in. Welcome. Um, this is going to be an interesting show. And, and I think we were just talking before we came on, Matt, you're actually going to go through some materials here, which is actually a little different on the show. Usually they just have to listen to us talk. So this is going to be <laughs> going to be impressive. Yeah, so, I, I, no, I'm happy to share a little bit of uh, content just to kind of get things going. But uh, you guys give me the stage hook whenever you want me to shut up. So, well, Matt, why don't you start? You know, tell tell everybody if they don't know you already a little bit about yourself, your background, and then we can kind of jump in and go from there. Yeah, sure. Um, so, well, thanks again for having me. Um, so, I'm a, I, you know, it, it's. I've struggled for years to explain what I do for a living. My my mother knows I live in DC and I I work for agent like groups that have strange acronyms, so she assumes I'm a spy. Um, but it's, I assure you, it's not true. So I um I'm a, I I think I best describe probably as a sales anthropologist. So I I bring research based methods to study changes in customer buying behavior and what the implications are for salespeople. And been doing that for a long time. So we, um, you know, we've done, done a lot of research, and some of that research has ended up in a few books. So we, um, I was co-author of the Challenger Sale and the Challenger Customer, and most recently the Jolt Effect, which came out um, the fall of last year, which is what we're going to talk about uh, today. There you go, Carson. Carson's got it. Brandon's got a hard copy, so there it is. Yeah. Well, right. I got to tell a story about that too, because when I started listening to the jolt effect, I was cutting the grass and I think my neighbors thought I was nuts because they were wondering why I stopped like every strip and was like taking notes. <laughs> um, absolutely love it. So we, we owe a great deal to you, Matt. And I, you know, we've done a lot of trainings on the challenger methodology. And I guess if Brandon Lee is the Kevin Bacon of social selling, then that makes you, if you're the anthropologist, <laughs> the Indiana Jones of social selling? I'm just on the outside looking in. I just, you know. <laughs> Maybe I am the Indiana Jones. I guess that's or like the Jane Goodall of, uh, of uh, sales. I like it. I like it. Oh, man. Uh, Carson, I think, um, you know, and, and really, Matt, we're really grateful to have you here. We're, we're excited to hear directly from you. And Carson and I have been going back and forth quite a bit for months on on jolt effect and carson before before we started you had you had a really really great statement that i think is honestly the best way to kick this off especially for anybody that hasn't read the book yet or don't, has no idea what we're going to talk about especially coming from challenger sale to what the foundation that you and i talked about or took from jolt effect so you want to kick that off because I, I just thought that was perfect for getting this conversation going no this is this is great um but what's what amazed me, Matt, and yeah, I'm just going to cut right into the heart, right? So what, what amazed me about Jolt Effect was the ability to, you know, mid and post pandemic, we have this amazing ability to look at the data of all these recorded calls because we've made this big switch yeah. hybrid and we have so much remote work and that's kind of at the basis. But what jumped out at me the most, two major terms, one, radical candor, mm. and two, you talking about how so many of us, myself included, have historically been trained to sell against FUD, fear, yeah, yeah. Out. And I mean, even today, I hear so many sales evangelists talking about, hey, we're, you know, we've got this timestamp. We're going to take away the discount if you don't sign by this date. And your way of approaching this, and I'm not going to give any of it away but because I want, I want people to hear from you, but about just really de-risking that decision that is what profoundly changed my outlook in reading Jolt Effect mm -hmm. now twice. 
Yeah, well, like I said to, I didn't know you also read it twice. I told Brandon, he's that's he's told me he read it twice. I'm like, that's one more time than I read it. But uh, but the um, uh, I think I think that's really cool. Those are cool pickups. The um, the radical candor thing. I'll give full. That's not my term. That was um, Kim Scott, who um, is just a brilliant uh, business writer, and uh, coined that term. Um, but I think it really does apply, and we can talk about how it applies in this uh, framework of the Jolt effect. But I think, you know, Carson, that the thing I hear most from sales salespeople and sales leaders is, um, you know, I've grown up in this world believing that my only enemy is the customer status quo. It's not the competition; it's the customer's deep-seated desire to do nothing because customers are lazy and they don't like to change. Like we're all lazy and we don't like to change. And if the customer starts ghosting me or disengaging from the sale, especially if they told me they want to buy and then they start pulling back, it's got to be that they still think their status quo is good enough. And so I come in with that FUD hammer and I think, you know, and you see a lot of this on LinkedIn, you're, you guys are hundred percent right. Like, you know, I just was reading today a post about like, here's your Q4 playbook. Like you got to dial up the cost of inaction and these things. And I'm like, actually what your customers are more worried about is not the cost of inaction. It's the cost of action. And, and that's the thing that's got them up at night. And so, you know, not for every customer, there are plenty of customers who aren't convinced to change, but those who are bought in that they need to change, the thing that often keeps them from moving forward is that, you know, it's what we call, it's, the, it's not the fear of missing out, it's the fear of messing up. Um, and uh, so, yeah, so I'll talk a little bit more about that research. I said, cause I, I'm sure we have some folks on here who are not, not familiar with it. And I'll give you the Cliff's Notes version and make Carson and Brandon feel bad for paying for the book because you guys will get the shorthand version. <laughs> <laughs> it's, 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 it's full of notes. We do this thing on my team calls every week called What Are You Learning? And uh, on two different teams that I've been a part of, I've shared your book and my learnings from that. Because again, I was I was trained FUD for years upon years. And don't get me wrong, yeah. mm -hmm. I'm just successful because of relationships that I've built. But sure. understanding that fear of messing up was the, really the profound breakthrough that I had. Yeah, you know, by, by the way, just, um, and this is not, this isn't point fingers to anybody. I mean, challenger sale is really a story. We talk about in challenger, there's a line that challengers are really good at helping the customer realize the pain of same is worse than the pain of change, right? So it's all about dialing up that FUD, that cost of inaction. And that is one of the things that challengers are very good at. Um, but I think what we realize in this research, it's not that that's not important. It's critically important. If your customer doesn't think they should change, like you, you're never going to have an indecision problem. Like you haven't even, you're not going to collect 200 bucks and pass go. But I think what really great salespeople have realized is that that's not enough. You know, it's it, sales, as we'll talk about, is there's there's two acts to the play. And there may be more, but there's at least two we've discovered. So, Well, Matt, let's jump in. Let's jump in some of the, the cool. slides you have. And if you're online listening, jump in with questions, because I, I think it, we can make this interactive as you kind of go through and take questions. And but we have yeah. some structure, which I think is going to be great. So, All right. so well, let's, let let's do, start there. Let me do this. Um, uh, uh, uh. Okay, I think. All right. So, sorry, this is a little bit. I'm always I always have to relearn the platform when we get on new platform. So, uh, where is my point slide? And this group, we'll oh, try and explain go. it as we go along too for the people on the podcast listening to audio. Yep. All right. Oh, see. of course. Yeah. Can you guys see that? All right. Oh, look at that. Well Great. done. Yeah. Perfect. Wow. All right. I didn't think I had the technical capabilities to pull that Man, out. We have here come here we are. <laughs> it is a brave new world. Okay. So uh, Jolt Effect, let's jump right into it. This is a, this is a story about a, a problem. This is one of those things that honestly, guys, I would say, um, I, I feel like a lot of my career has been like um, uh, around this concept of better to be lucky than good. And this is definitely um, one of those examples where we wrote this book in the fall of, uh, uh, to publish it in fall of last year. And we started researching this problem of uh, customer indecision back in uh, 2020. I'll tell everyone where the research came from and the data, because that's part of the story, Carson, as you said before. Um, but I think what is interesting is that um, back then, you know, things were actually pretty good in the B2B sales world. You know, we were, especially like places like SaaS and tech, were just blowing up, you know, God, reps were having no problem closing deals. And it was only, and as we started researching this, we actually had a fair number of sales leaders who said, I don't really think indecision is a problem. I don't think we have a lot of no decision losses. Um, we're actually, our bigger problem is like, we've got so much business and, and qualifying opportunities, making sure we go after the right customers. 
fast forward to fall of 2022 and even into the current uh, environment we're all selling into. And I think we all know that indecision, ghosting, radio silence has become a huge problem. But I will uh, share with you guys, you know, this is the data point we pulled from our uh, data set back in the summer of 2022, that anywhere between 40 and 60% of the average salesperson's qualified pipeline, so these are qualified opportunities, will ultimately be lost to no decision. So marked in, in the CRM system as closed, lost, no decision. And that's just a huge deadweight loss for any salesperson. But if you're a manager or a sales leader, you multiply that across the number of people on your team or in your organization, it gets pretty expensive. But again, I would I would argue for a lot of companies, especially in the SaaS space right now, the number is even higher than that. It's probably 70, 80 percent of deals being lost to no decision. Now, I mentioned that the data itself was actually part of the story here. Um, so we uh, we took and the, the the guys hinted at this in the uh, in the upfront, but back in the um, you guys remember in spring of 2020, right? Topsy turvy time in the world. Uh, There's the days of um, Tiger King and baking sourdough bread and all all the good stuff, right? Um, but because as um, these guys know, we're huge nerds, so we saw this as an opportunity to do a sales study because we had suddenly access to. Um, this mountain of recorded sales calls. Because remember, spring of 2020 was when sales went 100% virtual. Customers didn't want you in their office. They didn't even want you six feet away. They wanted you to stay on your side of the country. Do not come visit me. Everything happened on Zoom. And so we had access to millions of recorded sales calls. We recruited several dozen companies, said, hey, we're going to run a research study for about 18 months. Would you send us all of your sales calls, recorded sales calls, mapped, uh, appended to the rep who was selling the deal and the opportunity. So we could dynamically update did that opportunity close. Was it lost? Was one was lost to get close to no, due to no decision, et cetera. Um, we transcribed all those calls using a transcription engine. And then we use a machine learning platform from a company called Tether to study it at scale. Um, all told, we looked at 8,300 variables, all kind of pointed at this question of, um, why do customers do nothing? Like what would possess a customer, especially a customer to like go through an entire sales process and then do nothing? Why would they want to waste uh, not just our time, but their own time doing that? And more importantly, what are the best salespeople do to avoid it? Um, I'll pull forward a little bit of the good news here. Um, I started in a bit of a depressing spot, but the good news is this, is that high performers have figured out how to avoid this problem or largely avoid it, I should say. Um, average performer win rates in our study were 26%, which I think in the current environment, people might look at and say, gosh, I wish we were converting at 26%, but that was the average in our study. High performer win rates were closer to 60%, 59 to be exact. And in and of itself, that won't surprise anybody, but this part might surprise you that across 8,300 variables we studied, the biggest swing factor, the biggest explainer of that gap between average performers and high performers was how high performers dealt with what we would call the cold feet moment in the sale. This is the moment that typically happens after the customer says they want to buy, but before the point where they actually do buy, right? So this is the, the point where customers start, you know, um, uh, dredging up concerns and objections that you're like, why are we still talking about this? Like, I thought I put that concern to bed. I thought I handled that objection. I thought we, we got you on the phone with the reference customer. We did a POC, like we were good. And now all of a sudden, it seems like you're you're reconsidering your decision. Now, um, let's before I show you what high performers do, let's talk about what most salespeople do. And and um, Carson set up really nicely before. Um, this is a prototypical sales uh, or buying journey, I should say, but and and sales process, if you will, uh, that a customer goes through. So I know everyone's sales process is more complicated than this. Um, your customer's buying process is way more complicated than this, but there are basically um, three moments in a B two B sale. Moment number one is where we engage the customer for the first time. We find them in their status quo. This is the way they do things today. Maybe they use a homegrown solution. Maybe they use your competitor solution. Maybe they use your solution, but in a narrow use case and you want them to use it enterprise wide or use the full set of capabilities or use the platinum version, not the, the silver version, whatever it is. That's the way the customer does things today. Now, the first act in the sales play is to get them from what they do today to agreeing what they do today is not good enough and they need to move forward in a new direction and using your solution as the way to enable that, right? So we've got to get them to agree on a vision. And that is answering for the customer the why change question, right? You got to get them to say, status quo is not good enough. We need to move forward and we want to work with you guys. Now, the last step in the play or the second act in the play is 
uh, to get the customer from saying they want to buy to getting them to actually buy. And, and what we found in our study is that this is actually where a lot of deals go sideways, especially these days. Um, you get a lot of window shopping. You get a lot of customers who say they're bought in, but then they start hemming and hawing and waffling and wavering and straddling the fence. And, and they start ghosting you and going radio silent. And exactly as Carson said, that every salesperson has been taught that in this scenario, there's only one reason the customer's in, uh, hesitating, and it's because they are still suffering from status quo bias, right? They still believe what they're doing today is good enough. What you're talking about is not a compelling enough reason to change, or maybe this just isn't a big priority for them or in their, in their business. And so what you find in these sales calls, two and a half million sales calls, is that almost 75% of the time when the customer starts to vibrate after they've stated their intent, but before they execute the DocuSign, when they start to vibrate and waffle and waver or backpedal, 75% of sellers almost go back to the hammer of the status quo. Now, sellers do this in, in really one of three ways. The, the first attempt is almost always to reconvince the customer of how good the solution is, you know, to re-articulate the benefits, to um, point back to all the success that they you had in the pilot or the proof of concept or all the amazing reference calls you had or to point out the case studies and the proof points and the ROI projection and just talk that up because what you're trying to get the customer to realize is like, you're not going to get these all these benefits if you say no. How could you pass up on such goodness that we're going to offer you? If that doesn't work, the second play is usually the FUD play, which is make the customer realize the cost of inaction, right? Um, dial up the, the pain, right? Create the burning platform. Help them understand that they stand to lose significantly if they don't move forward. That the status quo is no, it's not just it's, that it's suboptimal, it's no longer tenable. Like this is a burning platform, you have to move forward. If those two plays don't work, almost every salesperson in our study resorts to the third play, which is the 10% discount that's only good this quarter, right? It's the urgency driver, right? Sometimes it's not it's not a discount. Sometimes it's like, um, hey, if you don't say yes now, you're going to have to wait six months to implement the solution because we're so busy. And then you're not going to get the full benefits next year and your boss is going to be mad at you and you're not going to get your bonus and blah, blah, blah. So those are the three plays we see sellers run. And it's, again, because sellers have been taught basically to dial up the FOMO, the fear of missing out. You're going to miss out on these benefits. You're going to miss out on this opportunity to fix your terrible status quo. Or you're just going to miss out on this discount that I'm offering you right now. This didn't surprise us that salespeople did this. In fact, it was probably encouraging to us um, that they were doing what they've been trained to do for years. But when we ran the data, we found something surprising, which is that that FOMO playbook uh, actually backfires way more often than it works out. It cre in fact, it increases the odds that a customer will wind up in a no decision state. This was pretty shocking to us because again, if you in the face of a lot of sales conventional wisdom, what salespeople have been taught for a very long time, and candidly, what we said, as I pointed out before, in the challenger sale, you know, challenger is really good at overcoming the customer status quo. So how could it be that um, that doing that um, would actually make things worse, not better? Um, and so we we dug into the data and we found something a bit surprising, which is that when a customer makes no decision, it turns out there are two reasons that happens. Now, salespeople have only ever been taught by one reason. The first reason is the one they've been taught, that the customer deep down prefers their status quo. What I'm doing today is good enough. What you're talking about is not a compelling enough reason to switch, or this is not a top priority for me or my business. Those are all status quo preference reasons that a deal could be lost in no decision. Um, but it turns out there's a second reason. And the second reason has nothing to do with the status quo. Um, it is customer indecision, which itself stems from their fear of failure. Now, a lot of people ask me, they're like, oh, isn't a no decision loss in fact a decision? The customer's deciding to stay with their status quo. And what I tell them is that, yes, 44% of the time, that is true. There are customers out there who are just being polite. They're not telling you that they believe their status quo is good enough and they're not that impressed with what you're proposing. And they just believe that they're going to stay put and they consciously make that decision. But 56% of the time, the customer winds up in no decision not because they don't believe in the value you're offering, but, but because, because they can't make a decision. They want to buy from you, but they can't pull the trigger. And the thing that keeps them from pulling the trigger is their fear down, the fear that something is going to go wrong. Now, when I show salespeople this, there, there are two things that surprise them. Uh, one is that you know, a lot of sellers, of course, sell to C-level executives. And these are, these are people who paid to, get paid to make the top call paid to make the big decisions. And so salespeople get confused over the fact that their customers are just afraid of messing up. They're afraid of screwing up or failing. 
Now, this, um, just to explain what's going on here, is actually tied to a deep-seated uh, human bias. I think we're, all, we're all familiar with status quo bias, right? Uh, the desire to just stay put, human laziness, the desire not to change. That has been the enemy we've been focused on for a very long time in sales. But there's another very, and arguably more powerful bias called the omission bias, which has been uh, thoroughly documented by a number of behavioral economists and psychologists, including these guys, that's um, Amos Seversky on the, right, on the left and Daniel Kahneman on the right, um, who did a lot of research around this concept um, um, called uh, omission and uh, in different types of loss. So let me just explain this in very short uh, fashion. So what these guys discovered, and again, this has been validated through countless so, uh, psychological experiments, uh, behavioral economics um, studies, is that human beings think about loss in two dimensions. On the one hand, you've got what are called errors of omission. This is when you lose out or you, you realize a uh, cost or uh, an error, you, you experience an error or loss because you didn't do anything. You chose not to act and you experience a loss as a result. So when we talk about the cost of inaction in sales, what we're talking about is an error of omission. You chose not to act and you experience a loss as a result. That is very different from what's on the right. That's an error of commission. An error of commission is when you experience a loss, not because you didn't act, but because you did act. You made a decision, you chose a course of action, and that decision led to a loss. Now, these two circles look like the same size on this page, but let me show you in your brain how they, uh, how they appear. It's like this. This is called the omission bias. This stipulates that people are more wired to avoid loss, even if it's the same exact size, quantity, and scope of loss, it is much worse for us as people to be personally responsible for that loss than to be an innocent bystander and have that loss happen, okay? So the shorthand for salespeople is this, that the fear of missing out, it turns out for your customers, is a heck of a lot less important to them than the FOMU. Now, what is the FOMU? The FOMU is the fear of messing up. Um, the not safe for work version is fofu, but these guys told me to keep it family friendly. So we'll let you figure out on your own what that is, right? If, if you get Brandon a, going, sometimes it isn't as family friendly, but yeah. You know. Okay. <laughs> um, so, um, so the fear of effing up, right? So this is this is a big deal for salespeople. What this tells you is that you look even at a very senior level, even when you're sa- selling to that C level executive, that you know very senior, that very top important top officer. They suffer mightily from being their fear that they will be personally associated with a mistake, that their name will be on a, on a purchase, a software purchase, a transformation engagement with a consulting firm, whatever it is, and it goes sideways and they are to blame. So that's thing one that salespeople get wrapped around the axle a little bit of. It's like, why are these decision makers so worried about messing up? It's because we all worry about messing up. But the second question salespeople ask me is, well, what are they worried about messing up? Like what specifically are they worried about? And the data was pretty telling here. Turns out there are three big fears of failure that customers have. The first one comes from choice overload. This is where we as salespeople, supported ably by our marketing team, put so many options in front of our customers, contract lengths, um, uh, use case specific deployments versus enterprise wide partner integrations, you name it, you know, different versions of the platform, silver, gold, platinum. We put all this choice in front of them. And when they look at all those choices, they get, they freeze. And the real concern is, I know I want to work with you as a vendor, but how to work with you? Because what I can't afford to have happen is I choose configuration A and it turns out configuration B would have been much better for us, but we can't change that for three years because we're locked into a three year contract. Now I've got egg on my face. So in that world, the safest decision for the customer is don't choose any option and just kick the can down the road. The second fear of failure comes from information overload. And this is the customer who's just worried that they haven't done enough homework, they haven't done enough research, that that, that all of their questions and fears will be addressed in the next white paper they read. Or if they just wait six months for the next Gardner Magic Quadrant to come out, then they will be able to say, I've left no stone unturned. What they're trying to avoid is a situation in which um, new information comes to light after the decision is made and that new information makes the purchase seem like not such a great idea. I'll tell you guys a real quick story. Uh, just the other day, um, a sales leader uh, from a tech company told me they, they sold the biggest deal of the year this year um, to a big financial services company. Um, two weeks after they got ink on the contract and they signed this deal and they drank champagne and it was a big win for them, biggest deal they've ever sold. Um, the Gardner Magic Quadrant came out and the Gardner Magic Quadrant showed that they were kind of meh, right? Sort of middle of the pack, not the worst, but definitely not the best. 
And what ended up happening was the whole deal started unraveling on them because the senior decision maker who signed off on it started getting bombarded by colleagues who's, who are forwarding him, you know, screenshots from the Gardner Magic Quadrant saying, hey, you know, the guys we just signed this multi-million dollar deal with, Gardner doesn't think they're that great. Have we talked to these guys? And what about those guys? And why didn't we talk to, you know, so on and so forth? Why didn't we go with the, the leaders? And so now this customer is going back and talking to other vendors while at the same time kind of rolling out the solution he'd already purchased, but sort of trying to find a way to weasel out of the agreement in case they find a better option. So again, this is something customers all fear. Um, the last one comes from expectations overload. This is where the customer feels like they might not get what they're paying for. Um, not that you're going to steal their money, but that may be true in some industries. But what they're really worried about is they won't see the full benefit. So think about um, in today's environment, any technology purchase or especially SaaS purchases, we just went through a reckoning, five to 10 years of countless SaaS licenses being purchased for every different function in the company. And then things got tight and the CFO started looking at how many of those licenses were being used and was horrified with what they found, that there were tons of unused licenses. And now they're renegotiating all their can contracts and they're canceling all these licenses and SaaS is paying the price. Think about your customer's fear when their hand is hovering over like the next SaaS agreement. And they're going to roll out a thousand seat licenses. They are deeply afraid that this is going to be like the next motion picture starring in this uh, in this theater, and they don't want to be um, they don't want to have anything to do with a, a starring role in that motion picture, right? They do they cannot afford to be uh, perceived as fools. They want to be perceived as heroes, and this is the customer who's basically saying, look. I need a guarantee from you as a partner, as a vendor, that we are going to get what we're paying for, that people will adopt this tool, that they we will see the ROI, we will see the cost savings, we will see the sales productivity improvement that you're promising. Because if we don't, and my name is associated with it, that's not just egg on my face. I could get fired, especially in this environment. So those are the three big fears that customers have. Now, just a couple more things I'll share with you guys. Um, if I were to put this together with the, you know, um, some of the research we've done around Challenger and everything we've learned to date around the importance of beating the status quo, here's what I'd tell you is that it's absolutely critical that salespeople beat the status quo. If you don't answer the why change question, if you don't show the customer that the pain of same is worse than the pain of change, and you don't get them over the hump, if you don't solve for their indifference, don't worry about indecision. You're never going to get far enough in the sale for that to be a problem. But I think what the data showed us is that great salespeople are not just really great at that part of the sale. They're also great at the second part, which they've never, most salespeople have underappreciated, didn't even know it was a deal, a, a thing that they had to deal with. The second part, overcoming indecision is ultimately about putting an arm around the customer and saying, it's going to be okay. You've made a great decision. You're working with a trusted advisor, so you don't need to worry about being surprised by information later. I've been your guide and your, your steward along this journey. I've got your back. And by the way, we've done this a thousand times before, and we have a recipe for getting value out of our solution, and you don't need to worry about it. Again, there's a safety net here. We're there to catch you. You're going to look like a hero, not like a fool. So again, this is uh, not about overcoming indifference, it's about overcoming indecision and instilling customer confidence. As you can see here, across the course of that buying journey, salespeople got to stop selling to the fear or dialing up the fear, and then they need to shift gears to start dialing down the fear, right? And that's ultimately what we're talking about. Now, the uh, the playbook that we talk about in the book is the Jolt playbook, and, and maybe we'll talk some more about this in the q and I'll give you guys a real high level here. Um, JOLT is an acronym, uh, judging indecision, offering your recommendation, limiting the exploration, taking risk off the table. Just very quickly, a judging level of indecision is about equipping salespeople with a new set of techniques designed to understand not just can the customer buy, but can this customer decide? And it turns out if they can't make a decision or you see that as, as too wide a chasm to cross to get them to make a decision, it might be an opportunity for disqualification, right? But part of the J is telling us what they're worried about. Are they worried about too many choices, too much information, or too much risk, and then I'm not going to get what I'm paying for? So that's where the OLT come in. The O is all about shifting our posture from offering endless number of options and diagnosing customer needs to actually telling the customer what to buy. At some point, let a thousand flowers bloom, but if you want your customer to make a decision, you got to chalk the field and you got to show them what they should buy and advocate for a path of action. Um, the L is all about limiting exploration. This is where the radical candor piece that Carson talked about earlier comes in. You know, look, 
customers will do research until the cows come home. Uh, but the re the data, our data is very clear that the more you feed information to them, the less likely it is that they'll ever conclude their learning journey and make a decision. What really great salespeople are good at is getting the customer to stop being, trying to be an expert themselves and start trusting the salesperson as their expert in earning the right to use a bit of radical candor to say, look, Carson, I don't think you need a fifth reference call. I don't think you're gonna learn anything new from that call than you learned in the previous four reference calls. Um, you know, and, and maybe there's some other way we can address your concerns, or let's just have a frank conversation about what's what's keeping you from making this decision. The T is about dealing with that expectations overload. It's about setting proper expectations, under-promising, over-delivering, uh, but it's also about establishing safety net options so the customer feels like um, that the downside risk is managed. It's a de-risk decision in that most of um, uh, what they're looking at is upside opportunity, not downside risk mitigation. Okay, so that's our Jolt playbook. And last thing I'll show you guys is, is the effect of this. So we were able to chart um, win rates by level of indecision demonstrated by the customer in the call. Um, and what we found is that um, there's not surprisingly, if you look at average performers or what we call core performing salespeople here, they do pretty well where there's low levels of indecision. By the way, if you find a customer who is unencumbered by the fear of failure, you should sell them every single thing your company makes as soon as humanly possible, right? right. So but here's, here's the other thing I'll tell you is that that's only 13% of the market that falls into the low level of indecision zone. 87% of the, the deals we studied were with customers who had either moderate or high levels of indecision. As you can see here, average performer win rates kind of fall apart the more indecisive the customer becomes. Now, if we look at jolt sellers, these are people doing the four things I just kind of gave a, a high level on a moment ago. Um, they knocked the cover off the ball with the decisive customers, not surprisingly, but they convert almost 60% of the opportunities with those moderately decisive customers. Statistically, that's the biggest difference because that's where most of the opportunities reside is in that moderate indecision zone. And they still do really well. In fact, better than average. Remember the average in our say was 26%. They converted 31% with those deeply indecisive customers. So um, it's uh, five, more than 5x greater win rate uh, than average performers see with those really kind of deeply mired in indecision uh, types of uh, opportunities. So that's about as fast as I can walk through it. So I'm going to stop sharing and <laughs> we go to some Q&A and discussion here. Um, but just a high level again, when I present this to sales teams, there's like um, we go into each of those pillars because there's there's some interesting and surprising data in each of those. And maybe we could talk a little bit about that here. But again, happy to go wherever you guys and the audience wants to go. Yeah, I want to make a quick segue and then we'll jump into some great audience questions. But I was thinking as you were going, Matt, like I could listen to you all day, but then I realized I, I have. So <laughs> I I don't we spend a lot of time on this show talking about, you know, getting into the C-suite and, and also the impact that sometimes social selling and AI can have in the mix. And it's all about probability, right? There were two things that really jumped out at me in what you just went through. Um, number one, sea levels, they're not invincible. In fact, no. yeah. the biggest deal that I've done over my last, over my career, there were seven significant sea level changes within the two year sales cycle. And so oh, yeah. to your point, they need to win. And so we have to show them the path to either win or make that decision. And the way I boil this down to my team, the customer in action is not because they're married to status quo. It's just they're not ready to commit to you. And yeah. it's going to happen because they don't see the value in what you have to offer. It's just that you have not de-risked the decision enough for them at this point in time. And I always like to make movie references, as Tom and Brandon know. Um, I could do some really low-hanging not, wait, not just movies that Brandon was in, right? Right, not just. <laughs> okay, <got it. laughs> I can go for a movie reference that's low-hanging fruit like Moneyball, but that's too easy because we talk about that all the time. I was thinking Beautiful Minds, you know, all the computations, you know, John Nash doing these math problems in his head and mapping all this stuff out because when I listen to you, that's what I think about. It's all about probability and odds. But you showed us what a jolt seller can do. When we leverage things like social selling and AI, through your research, where do you think we can ultimately take this from a probability and odds perspective? Yeah, yeah. a great question. Let me, let me just speak to one thing you said earlier, uh, Carson. So the, you know, you talked about the sea level and how they're not immune. I think what's really interesting is, and again, surprises salespeople that their sea level buyer is just as afraid of screwing up as, as anybody else. What is true, though, about sea level decision makers is they're much less likely to talk about it. Because again, they've got 
the C the C level title, they've got the, um, the the VP title, whatever it is, and it's embarrassing. It's embarrassing to admit that you're worried about how you'll be perceived, not just by the higher ups, but maybe by your investors, your board, and even by your team, right? So, so in getting them comfortable to talk about it is something we talk about a lot in the book. Is how do you how do you get indecision and fear of failure on the table? So they can be discussed openly, but in a safe kind of way, right? Um, and it, not in a way that embarrasses your customer, because that's not going to end well, but in a way that makes it, uh, it's an empathetic uh, engagement. Like, I understand um, that this is a hard decision. I'm here to help, right? And I want to get you to a great decision, whether that's buy from us, don't buy from us, what have you. I, I think, you know, it's, it's interesting. It's a big question um, uh, you asked about kind of where this is all going to go. And I I think um, it's funny because somebody asked me this the other day. Um, I just got kind of roundabout uh, answer to your question, but somebody asked me, you know, has indecision always been there, or is it like one of these things that all, you know we only were able to discover because we have the technology to do it, right? We we never studied two and a half million sales calls, so we didn't know before. And so I think in some respects that's true. Like it has been there, and it's been underappreciated, and now we have the technology to see it. So it's like that whatever the name is of that fancy telescope that's like a million miles past the moon. And it sends back these amazing pictures of the outer galaxy that were all, always there. They've been there for billions of years, but we never had the technology to see it. So I think indecision is kind of like that. But at the same time, I actually think that indecision is getting worse. And I think if you think about the things that are causing it, too many options, too much information, too much risk. Um, those things are all getting worse on a just a secular trend basis. So every provider out there is, as a partner ecosystem, they have tons of options. You know, they're, they're throwing options. It's eminent configurability for your customer. Information. I mean, in any space, there's more information written about um, that company, its competitors, that industry, that use case, that technology today than there was yesterday. And tomorrow, there'll be more than there is today. Your customers will never get through it all. They'll never become the experts that we are about what we do. And the risk too, you know, companies have been on a long journey from selling products which are pretty transactional to selling solutions which are sticky, right? They're, they offer transformation opportunities for the customer, but that's pretty risky. Like everybody loves selling transformation, but transformation is a double-edged sword because it sounds really cool, but it's a big commitment. It's a big risk for your buyer, right? Um, and so I think those things are kind of on a secular trend to get worse. Now, from a from an odds perspective, I do think that, um, there, look, if, if the only thing that comes out of this research is that that salespeople hit the pump the brakes and hit the pause button before they assume that that hesitant customer, like every hesitant customer is a nail and I got my FOMO hammer and, and my FUD hammer is ready to go to town. If they at least hit the pause button and explore a little bit to understand, is it because you're not sold on the value? That may actually well be and maybe your FOMO hammer is a really good hammer to bust out. But if it's not, if it's that the customer's intellectually bought in, if they're thinking like, you can stop selling me now, I'm sold. And instead they're worried about being associated with a purchase that goes sideways and doesn't pay off. That's that FOMO hammer is going to make things worse, not better. And so you need that dial down the FOMO playbook, right? Mm -hmm. um, the no playbook. So I think if, if sellers could just at least do that, I think we'd be in a, a much better place than we are today because the FUD playbook, the FOMO tactics are so pervasive and you know, customers hate it. It's just like drives them crazy. Um, and it, it feels like high pressure sales tactics. And look, I'm very, I'm very sympathetic. Sellers are in a tough spot right now because it's a tough environment out there. And so then they start leaning on these techniques even harder and it makes it even worse. So, you know, and, and Matt, one thing I I've seen recently, as you were talking about this in some sales, I think there are clues to indecision that are all over the sales cycle in yes. a lot of cases. Yeah. And a Absolutely. specific example I've heard recently in some cycles I've been involved in is, well, we're worried about adoption. Will people use, this is technology. There you go, right? bingo, yep. And what I'm realizing is the way that we try and handle that is, of course they will, look how great it is. They're gonna love it, they're gonna love it, they're gonna love it. When in fact, it's really a signal or a clue of indecision that we need to be recognizing. So I think a big part of this is recognizing indecision when we see it and yes. not just trying to check off another box because they're handling an objection. Yeah, you know, it's, it's a great point. Uh, let me, I'll share something that's actually, it's actually not in the book, which is, um, I blame the publisher, not us, because like they had a deadline and we had to finish. And like, so we, we were still going through the data after we sent the manuscript in and we discovered something pretty interesting. We had a lot of questions from folks about 
you know, what techniques are useful to identify and decision. And I think the one, uh, Tom, is exactly what you said, which is engaging in really good active listening. And I think also recognizing that sometimes the things customers are asking for are saying you might think are good things, like I want another demo with the same team we've seen the past five demos. I want another reference call. I want to do another POC in another part of the business, you know, to, to continue to collect data and build the business case. Like that feels good to some sellers. Like I, cool, I have something to put in the CRM system. I have something to tell my manager when we have our next pipeline review that, oh, no, no, no. Like we've got another call coming up. We've got another demo, another reference call, you know, and it feels like we're making progress. But in fact, many of those things are masking underlying fear of failure and indecision and are actually a bad thing, not a good thing. So I think it's like tuning our listening for signs of indecision, as you said. Now, especially as I mentioned before, senior executives are going to be very loath to um, to admit that they are scared of getting fired or they're scared of how they're going to look. They, they don't talk about this. In fact, I'll tell you guys, I did a dinner with um, some senior execs not too long ago. CTO of one of the world's biggest manufacturers stormed out of the dinner after I did the presentation because she was so offended at the suggestion that people like her were afraid of failure. And she said, I make a hundred decisions a day that I would get fired if I was worried about screwing up. Like that is, that's not how I got my job. Like I gotta go. As soon as she left and the, and the rest of the clients cleared out, the technology company that was hosting the meeting, uh, they were her, she was their client, told me she's the most indecisive buyer they have. So, you know, so look, it's, it's something, it's uncomfortable talking about it. So how do you get on the table? We went back into the data and we found this technique that high performers were using. We, we borrow a term from submarine warfare, actually. Um, it's uh, We call it pings and echoes. So open-ended questions aren't really useful here where you say like, hey, Carson, like when you go to the Cheesecake Factory, do you leave hungry or satisfied? Like, can you make a decision on what to order? You know, um, Or saying like, hey, Brandon, are you worried about getting canned for this decision? I'm just curious. Like, you know, um, like those are not great questions. But what you can do is try to articulate the fear you think your customer's suffering from, but in a way that doesn't out them, but but makes them benchmarks them and makes them understand this isn't something everybody worries about and calibrates it and gets it on the table so it can be discussed. So it might be something like, hey, Tom, you know, um, you, uh, we, you know, we, I put a lot of options in front of you. Um, sounds like your team loves everything we've shown you. But I'm just curious, um, and here's why I'm gonna ask this question is that at about this point in the sale, I find that a lot of customers start spinning their wheels a little bit on what, what's nice to have and what's need to have. If I asked you guys right now, do you think you could tell me what are the must have capabilities and what are the things you might want to wait till next year or the year after to implement? Um, and look, the reason I ask this is not because I sense that you guys don't know. It's just that I know lots of other customers struggle with this because we're really proud of what we do. And we probably showed you maybe too much stuff. Could you tell me what's really important to you? And if you can't, I'd love to be a resource to you to help guide you to make that decision because you told me early on, budget is not unlimited and you got to make some hard choices and I want to help you make the right ones. And if I'm misreading the situation, then help me understand what what else might be, you know, worrying you about this purchase and moving forward. What, what might you think might go wrong? Might be adoption, might be something else. Now you might say back to me like, you know what? Um, we were just being nice uh, and saying we like, there's a lot of stuff you show us we have no interest in, but I can tell you right now what we want and what we don't want. Or you might say, yeah, uh, honestly, I don't really know. You know, if we had to make a decision today, I think we'd really be more pressed to make that call. We'd use a little bit of help. So that what's nice about that is it gets it on the table. It doesn't make embarrass the customer. It makes them feel very normal because other customers are worried about this too. But it allows you to, again, like a, a surface ship pinging the water to see if they yep. get a reflection back from that submarine because you, you can't see the indecision because right. they're not talking about it, right? So you've got to get it on the table. Yeah. Hey, Matt, I have a question. Um, and I think I saw, I think Klaus had the same question because, um, you know, what, what I sell to a lot, and this is where Carson and I are on kind of the different ends. I sell to a lot of SMB. Yeah. Um, and so I'm usually talking to founder, CEO, some of the variables you guys were talking about, you know, the CXO getting, you know, fear of getting fired and things like that. Yeah. I generally don't, you know, deal with that. Uh, does this pertain to smaller size companies? Is, is this just relevant for enterprise? Yeah, great, great question. So we, we, our data set cut across, we looked at smaller deals sold to, you know, more of an SMB kind of sale, um, and which kind of moved on more of a transactional cadence. And we looked at um, uh, large enterprise deals where, you know, start to end the entire sales cycle took almost the entirety of our, our study cycle, which was like 18 months. So it was like a year plus sales cycle, you know, $100 million plus deal size. 
we didn't find any difference in level of indecision until we actually put um, we put some just for for the hell of it. We actually fed in some consumer calls into the model. So think about like call center reps selling like uh, cell phone plans or cable service or like travel insurance, things like that. And we actually found that no decision loss rates were actually e were really high in those consumer segments. They're probably closer to like 60% um, in the S case and closer to 40% in large enterprise. That's why, remember earlier I showed you guys the range, 40 to 60% of deals lost to no decision. The reason for that range was transactional sales into more of an SMB space had a higher no decision loss rate because customers do a lot of window shopping. And for them, it's not a huge investment to get on a call or two and then ghost the salesperson. Enterprise deals where you're talking about like multi-million dollar solutions, customers think a little bit before they enter into those, those purchase journeys, right? Because they know it's going to be a huge time suck for them. They're, I would love to say they're worried about wasting the salesperson's time, but that's not true at all. They're worried about wasting their own time. And if they know deep down, we're never going to make a decision, I'm going to think twice before we're heading down that path. Mm -hmm. Now, consumer calls were more like 80%, no decision loss, right? And if you guys think about it, like think about how many things we put in our Amazon shopping cart that we never buy. <laughs> that's a perfect example. But, uh, but yeah, so there was a little bit of range there, but the, the effectiveness of some of the techniques didn't vary at all, actually. Um, just as effective in simple transactional sales as in large scale enterprise sales. And I, and I think that's interesting. It speaks to, and Carson, you and I talk about this later too. I think Carson and I, we both love social selling for different reasons. And I think for, for Carson on the swarm approach and the research approach, and then on the smaller companies, one of the things that I like about it is the trust factor. Yes. Right? You yeah. know, the use of the show builds a lot of trust. The use of the conversations we have in in um, in social and the people we engage with in social builds a lot of credibility and trust. Yeah. And I think that speaks to the data that you just spoke about right there. I, Brandon, I, I think you're, you're on something I think is really important. Now, we didn't we didn't study this per se, um, social selling per se in the research. However, I think so. We've done some more recent research actually um, for uh, folks might be interested. We did a study of uh, doer sellers. So these are professional services partners. So these are people who basically sell their own advisory capabilities. So think about like partners in law or accounting or consulting or investment banking, wealth management, etc. We just published those results in HBR a few week a few weeks ago, and one of the things we found there is that those folks rely heavily because buying advisory is such a black box for a customer. You can't test it, right? You can't demo, or, um, or maybe you can demo, but you can't pilot. You can't kick the tires on somebody's smarts, right? A consultant's expertise is very hard to test, and so it's a little bit of a leap of faith. So those those um, best partners in that world um, rely heavily on social proof and. Uh, demonstrating, building that trust, which is partly a function of their network and other folks who they know and are connected to can vouch for them. But I think about this from a social selling standpoint, my hypothesis would be that this is a phenomenal de-risking technique, right? When we can leverage our network and we can establish connections and I can say, Brandon, you know, I, um, I know you, I see you work with Tom. Tom and I actually were colleagues at this company before um, we actually worked with Tom at his last company um, blah, 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 you know, um, we should, but building those connections because people buy from people they know and they trust, right? Mm -hmm. And having that fundamentally, I think, de-risks it. So it's like, oh, there's a basis of trust. There's a, a relationship that even exists here that I can rely on almost as a safety net and gives me confidence that I'm not going to be left holding the bag. You're not going to oversell uh, oversell me, overpromise, underdeliver, et cetera. That's really yeah. good. Yeah. Well, there's, do you have another question, Brandon? Sorry. No, no, I was just going to say there's a lot there. I know we're out of time, but my, yeah. my brain's going down several different trails. Yeah, I was going to say we didn't really have enough meat in this episode. So we're going to have to <laughs> talk about meat. We pick this up in future. No, and, and a lot of the comments in here, and I'm sorry we're not going to get a chance to get to all the questions and comments here, but maybe, you know, I think a lot of these are addressed in the book as well. But I think it's, um, to me, the biggest takeaway that is just keep that radar on and look and just start by looking for signs of indecision rather than looking for signs where I need to talk more about, you know, the my features, benefits and the and the FUD, as you you pointed out. And I and test that I have a sales call coming up in eight minutes here. I'm going to 
go on to that call very differently after listening to this than I would have otherwise. And I'm going to listen for that. You know, it's with a group of people and and so forth. And Tom, you're, you're, you, uh, I loved your adoption example. It's a perfect one, um, especially in this current environment. You know, look, I, I think we all, we've all been a part of deals where the customer said, you can stop selling to me now. I'm sorry. Right. That would be great if they all said that. Then you know it's like, okay, cool. We're done convincing right. now you. Now we can move to the next phase. Now right. we can move to the next stage. But customers don't they don't provide such a clear roadmap sometimes. Well, Matt, thank you. Really, really you good guys. stuff. I'm gonna go re-listen again to the to the book. Carson, I might do it while mowing my lawn just so I can impress my neighbors also. Don't so chop your can, toes off. That's yeah, all I can't be Don't do it while driving because I, I don't recommend <laughs> taking notes on Matt's book while you're driving. <laughs> Not a great idea. No. But, um, that was great, Matt. <clears throat> Thank you so great much. For your guys. Thank you for the invitation. Yeah, no, this was fantastic. And I think, you know, that one of the big takeaways too, you know, I always like to say I pride myself in being a student of selling. And I love the fact that we have the ability to study data around hard data that doesn't lie around calls and trends. And it doesn't mean that selling with FUD didn't have a percentage of probability of working. However, if you really get to the heart of sitting in and de-risking the decision and helping these C-levels and VPs come out as winners, your chances of success go way up. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And you're right. I think this is an exciting time uh, with all the data we have. And uh, hopefully this is the beginning of you know lots of uh, lots more database research around um, what great sellers do, and I think we're going to have some more dis surprising discoveries as as more research is done. So, well, I can't wait to read whatever the next book is, Matt. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm still having flashbacks from the last one, so we'll, <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> it is kind of an arduous process. <laughs> all right, right. Well, again, if you guys. want the book, I'm sure it's on Amazon and is, all yeah. the local places there. Carson, wrap yeah. us up. Until next time, thank you everyone for joining. And happy social selling. Thanks, Take everyone. Care, guys. Bye, everybody.